Produced by Victoire. Victoire gives a special thanks to the EWF, Empire Wrestling Federation, and Mr. Jesse Hernandez, as well as SoCal Wrestling TV. Find the app on Roku. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Power and Glory, the podcast. This is a place where you discover the power of truth. And I am joined today by my partner in justice, WWE, WCW superstar, ladies and gentlemen, Paul Roma. Paul. Well, well, thank you, sir. I really appreciate always that great uh, intro to coming into Power and Glory. Uh, and listen, right off the bat, i got to say, Power Plex, those subscribe buttons right now. Right. right now, before you forget, and we're going to remind you throughout this show. Don't worry, because we know how some of you people are. Yeah, that's right. You've got to <laughs> you've got to powerplex that subscribe button. You got to hit the like, and you got to share this with your friends and family. We greatly appreciate it. Before we begin today's episode, across your screen right now, you'll see the Power and Glory the podcast T-shirts. They will be available on pre-order. In fact, this coming week. So order yours in time for Christmas. And of course, just a reminder, WrestleCon 2025 is right around the corner. April in 2025 in Las Vegas, Nevada. Paul and I will be there along with Mario Mancini, Jim Powers. You'll find our booth there. So make sure you come over and pay us a visit. Uh, today, Paul, we've got a special guest. It's going to be a very special episode. As you viewers can see at the bottom of the screen there, a rather elaborate set uh, that set belongs to the co-host of another of our shows here on the network, Stylin. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome WWE and AEW superstar Rico Casatino. Rico. Rico. I think somebody took him out. I think someone took him out. It looks like he, <laughs> he was ready to eat dinner there. It looks like it. Um, and I'm going to... Send him a quick text here and make sure he's okay. Yeah, it does look like someone took him out. Oh, oh, there I, I hear him. He just popped up. Rico. Yeah, I don't know. It sounds like he's being choked. Yeah, it sounds like he's being choked or something. He's he's frozen on the screen here, folks. I don't know what what's going on. We're having some technical difficulties. Oh well, he popped off. I'm sure he'll be right back with us, Paul. But um. Yeah, Rico Constantino. So, Paul, have you ever met Rico? I've never met Rico. No? Other than, on, you know, other than on this show, no. I have not had the pleasure. Yeah, well, he's he's a wonderful guy. Uh, he was obviously in WWE and AEW more recently, and we're going to get into that, viewers, today. Uh, this episode is certainly going to touch on the Italian, Sicilian, uh, because Paul is Italian, and Rico is Sicilian. So we're going to talk a little bit about the history there and also the evolution of AEW, WWE, and how the business has evolved. But while we wait for... Oh, there he is. He's back. Rico, you back with us? Hey, what's the matter <laughs> you? I'm, a, I'm a taking care of the family business, you know. I just, I just I don't have much time. I just, I, I, gotta, I got things I got to do. Yeah, you got you things know. you got to take care of, you know? <laughs> yeah. You know the family business, but I I'd like to address uh, this thing where people think Italians are violent. We're not violent people. We're businessmen. You know, I have a family business. I'm I do olive oil. Oh, that's what yeah. I do. Olive oil. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I had to go out and make my rounds today. Yeah. So, but uh, <laughs> oh wait wait wait, I need to get a little comfortable. Uh, yeah, doing doing my rounds, today <laughs> and uh, you know it's it's kind of hard, you know, when you're you're driving around a lot, and, you know, you, you got to get comfortable. Yeah, yeah, here we're in the West. There could be some cowboys out there. I don't know, but I'm also prepared for that. <laughs> so I'm just trying to get a little comfortable, and uh, uh, I think that's it. To This is my little bambino. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Lovely memories of little bambino. Oh man. Okay, okay. Oh. We're ready. Got, okay, we're ready. I've got to uh, Now you're unloaded. Wine. I'm always loaded. <laughs> well, there you go. So so now you've confused the audience. 
Rico, because you I said am. you said you're Italian, but you, I'm I just Sicilian. Feel, yeah, oh, so, yeah. I thought you, I thought I heard you say Italian there. Uh, so you're you, thinking too much. You're thinking too much. Yeah, I, I do think too much. Someone here has to. But yeah. <laughs> speaking, <laughs> speaking, speaking of which, though, but Rico, this is the first time you're meeting Paul Roma. So I wanted the two of you. Oh, just hold up the phone. The phone. Hello? Hey, Carmine. Carmine, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I told you to get the horse. Yeah, get the horse. Yeah, no, 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 no. We don't cut the head off the horse no more. No, no. Pizza <laughs> would be all over us. No, I just want you to put the horsey in his garage so when he goes to get in his car, maybe the horsey do a little poo-poo in the garage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he'll get the message. Oh, it's an man. offer you can't refuse. <laughs> <laughs> okay, come on. I gotta go. Talk to you later. Bye. Wow, more oh, family, more family business. business, more family uh, business. Yeah, so yeah, much. That, wow. Come on, wanted to cut the horse's head off. I said we don't do that no more. I got. Wow. I, I got to ask you, Paul. Is family life like that in the Italians? Uh well, other than cutting the horse's head off, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, Very it's uh, I gotta get this out of my mouth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Rico, ah. for doing that little little performance right there. As always, <laughs> a true Paul. He's a true entertainer. This man, you know, he he's done so many things. Paul, he surprised me yesterday as I was telling you. He did it. He did another TV show which he won. It was like you know the sports competition shows, the Fort Boyard. I was telling you about Rico. You won twenty five grand on that show, right? We did. Back in the nineties, so this was prior to him getting. It was nineteen ninety two, right yeah. after my gladiator run. Yeah, wow. yeah. Paul could have done stuff like that. Paul was a oh super, yeah, super athlete as well. A lot of those so, guys got hurt on the uh, gladiators. Yeah. Oh yeah, those, it, uh, you know the contenders, uh, because yeah. gladiators were just playing for pride. They got paid anyway. We were playing for, uh, you know, the money the championship and stuff like that. And I told Amir yesterday, the reason why I went out for gladiators is uh, Samuel Goldwyn, four point B. They said, these five guys are the best, the best of the best. So what made me do the challenge is I wanted to see how I measured up to what they call the best. Right. And that's how I took it. It wasn't about the money. It wasn't about TV. It was, I'd have done it without TV, but if you're calling them the best, well, I got something to say about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You I know, agree. and so that's, that's why I did the gladiators. Yeah. You yeah, too. Well, you, I'm sorry. Go on. No, no, go ahead, Paul. Go ahead. Well, when you watch the gladiators and I'm sure some, some of our, our listeners um, have, has seen the show and if they have it, they could tune in and take a look back then. Um, there weren't many people that could physically stand up to them. And that was the first thing I, I took away from watching the gladiators. I said, well, and because you said this just now, I said to myself, well, I could get in there and I could destroy these guys. I said, but you know what? They probably don't want somebody like me. I, they probably won't let me on the show because, you know, I'm too, maybe I'm too physical for them, right? Maybe I'm going to pose a challenge to them, right? I proposed that challenge. And now it's not, you know, what they want to see. Do they want to see this? you know, lesser athlete, um, you know, like a smaller person, maybe 120 pounder that they could pick up and just throw through the air. And, yeah. um, and that's kind of how I, I saw the, the American gladiators. I didn't get to see you and, and, um, you know, for whatever reason, but, um, you know, as far as the other people I saw, I didn't see anybody. And the one person that I did see actually gave them a hard time. Um, and that was only a, a one off where I, you know, I said to myself, oh, finally, somebody that has some size, not mm -hmm. that he was really muscular, but more of like a had that football body. You know, he had some right. some weight to him yeah. and he did give them a hard time. But um, I, I, after that, I, I never saw anybody of that, you know, I say magnitude, but of that caliber mm -hmm. anymore, because I, I think they probably said, hey, listen. If we keep going through this, we're gonna get we're gonna get wiped out here. 
right? We're not going to, we shouldn't have to fight that hard. Mm-hmm. To, to they ended up these. getting wiped out anyway. Cause yeah. they, cause they didn't have the proper tra- uh, physicians on board. They worked hurt. You know, there was no extras. Mm-hmm. And I, I was season two. So they count season one, the pilot as a season. So I'm, I went into season two and they dropped two male gladiators and they brought in two more. So they dropped Titan and Malibu and they brought in Thunder and Turbo. Mm-hmm. Okay. My year. Yeah. And so Thunder you, was 280 pounds. That's huge. a big guy. Yeah. yeah uh, to, big to, be able to, to be able to move around like that, though, with that kind of conditioning at that weight, he must have had to put a lot of hours in on the cardio for that one. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a, it's incredible. As I sit here with my two you know partners in all of this, you both are very similar, yet dissimilar in many ways as well. But you both have that same drive. And I think that, you know, I want to explore that from the Italian Sicilian background. Well, <laughs> well I was going to just touch on that when you were saying that. Mm-hmm. It's I, I believe it's it's an Italian bloodline, um, which just extends out over time. Does it get lost? Sure. Is it lost now? Yes, for the most part. There are some families that are still you know, strong in, in that bloodline. Um, right. But again, you know, Rico, myself, Mancini, uh, that's how we were brought up, you mm-hmm. know? And if, if, if Rico was to tell you how he was brought up and then I tell you mine, and Mario tells you his and another Italian tell you his, you're going to look at him and go, well, this came from the same people, the mm-hmm. same guy. Mm-hmm. Cause it's all the same. Nothing's yeah. different. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but it was a culture that, that worked. Yeah. What 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 do you think it is? What what is the je ne sais quoi Rico in the Italian culture that makes that so distinguished? Well, we when we when the Italians started coming over, my grandfather came over on Lusitania and he was from Palermo, Sicily, baker. And then when I got to know him, he did still didn't speak English. And my father was born in Brooklyn, I was born here in Vegas, so I'm only a second gen. Mm-hmm. You know, and some with Italian fathers, they take great pride in their men, their boys. They want their boys to become men. They right. want them to have a good worth ethic, good respect, earn an honest living. And they're, they are very uh, disciplined about it. Mm-hmm. You know, there is consequences for doing things the wrong way, which people can't do now. But in an Italian home, you know, uh, you had the belt. Did you get the right get the belt, Tony? Yeah, well, man, look, not the listen, swats. I, I, oh, forget it. My father's hand was hard enough. Yeah, my mother got the belt, used the belt, and my dad could smack with his hand. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, it was a very organized house. We had breakfast, lunch, day. everything was organized. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, yeah, we you had sat, family you, you time came to the table. Yeah. Right. Oh, it was not yeah. sitting in front of the t- TV. Went off. Hmm. Hmm. You know, so, and yeah. then we got together at family events at each other's house. My gosh, it was a festival oh. every time. Yeah, yeah. Every Sunday it was at, well, we went to the house that had the most land, property. That was my dad's. So, you know, everybody, and we're talking about both sides, came over. And it it's just a festival. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, that was that was what Sunday was. And then it was, you know, okay, this is the last meal of the day and we're going to clean up and you know, then we're going to sit for a minute, then everybody's going to disperse. Mm-hmm. And then everybody went their own way. Um, again, you know, did we go to like a park? Sure. We all, you know, migrated out of park also. But again, like he said, you know, nowadays, you know, your father hits you, you call the cops, he gets arrested. Mm-hmm. Back then, your father calls the cops, the cops will stand there and watch your father beat you a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and if you were bad, the cops slapped you around, brought you to the father, and, the, and the, yeah. they found out you disrespected the cops. Then yeah. your father smacked you around again. Yep. Yeah. 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 Even even in my time, you know, and that's you know, a little bit you know, after you guys when you were young, still the same thing. I, you know, I I my dad disciplined me. Again, it's a complete culture shock because my dad has, you know, an Arabic background. So, you know, he he but he raised me with that similar, it's all Mediterranean. Yes, it's all that part of the world that, raises that, their children that way. Yeah, that part of the world. I remember getting forced to sit at the table, and my dad will be watching this. I know he will, but I always tell that story. We we would eat couscous, an Arabic mm. dish, delicious dish. Paul, one day you got to try it. 
um, and probably in Vegas. And um, yeah, I was eating, and I, and at the time I didn't like vegetables. I could not stand cucumber or carrots. And he said, "You're going to sit there until you finish everything." And I remember yeah. sitting at that table on that Sunday afternoon for an hour and fifteen minutes, trying to stomach down, you know, crushing the little carrot into the couscous so I couldn't taste it that much. Um, <laughs> but but and, and and my dad would force me to do martial arts too. You know, I got through. I started because of the Karate Kid, like most kids my age did. And I was doing really well, but then I became a teenager. I, was, ah, I don't want to wake up at eight o'clock or seven o'clock on a Saturday morning. I don't want to go this week. He forced me to go, forced me to go. For, I th I'm thankful for that because I got my black belt in uh, Shotokan karate. So same kind of discipline, you know, and, and for and you're know, pushing you to greater heights, um, a Mediterranean thing. But I, I just wonder, like, where... You know, obviously, because it was Rome at one time. So the Romans were very disciplined and conditioned in everything they did. I mean, look at their society. Uh, they, they forged quite a bit. But I'm just wondering, um, you know, why, considering now we've everybody migrated all across the planet, why that hasn't seeped in a little bit more? It's still kind of uh, caught in those Italian neighborhoods and, and places like the same with the Arabic neighborhoods. It's, it's kind of stuck. It hasn't really fanned out, even though people have married people of different ethnicities, uh, backgrounds and stuff like it hasn't changed society as a whole. It's just kind of, it's caught there, you know? Well, well, it hasn't, it hasn't, it has not changed, as you said, some, mm -hmm. but very small. Like if you go to little Italy, right over here, um, You'll you'll see that you're very safe on the streets. Okay, right? You you just have that comfort. You you are not getting mugged in Little Italy. Okay, because if you do, those people are going to end up dead somewhere. They will catch them. Oh and yeah, it just doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, that that's gone as far as when when you start fanning out and, and you look around you, that's gone. We we were able to be as you said. Your father said you got to sit there and eat. And as far as I know, with the Italian culture, in my family, my father would let everybody put food on their plate first. Mm -hmm. And then he took his. Mm -hmm. And now here with like my daughter say, hey, dad, you want this? Like if she can't finish, she knows not to get up and throw it out. Mm -hmm. She knows to ask first. Mm -hmm. Why? Because that's how I brought her up. I said, listen, you don't throw any food out. Mm -hmm. You can't finish. You you ask me if I want it. You ask your mother if she wants it, but you don't just throw it out. Mm -hmm. That's a waste. That's a shame mm -hmm. that yes. you should do that. There's people that don't eat or that are starving and nope, that doesn't happen here. So mm -hmm. now her thing is, hey, dad, you want this? I can't finish it. Mm -hmm. And there's times when I can't fill it, you know, finish it, but I'll eat it. Mm -hmm. I just refuse to throw it out or put it in something, a Tupperware, and then save it for, you know, the next day or later on, maybe a couple hours from now. Yeah. But today's culture, everybody's grabbing, you know, uh, worried about, you know, them being first mm -hmm. and not the the family being first or children being first. And that's why and I'm going to get off here for a second. I'm going to stop. Uh -huh. That's why they say in the worst parts of the Bible is when the parents start taking the lives of their own kids and that's what's happening today oh yeah yeah we, yeah we know about that coming in those days we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on as it comes out organically uh rico you same, both same thing with i echo tony because that's you didn't throw food out and the longest meal for me was liver okay i just can't, even to this <laughs> day i can't eat liver it is pretty that gross. was the longest longest meal for me. Yeah, it's yeah, and you know what? But that was a delicacy to us back then, right? Yeah, yeah. And now today, never. Well, I shouldn't say today. Just as I got away from my family, that never, that was never bought ever. It was never a meal for nope. me ever. Yeah. Nope. Tristan. Yeah, no I ate everything else, and I've eaten stuff because of bodyguarding and traveling. I had eaten stuff that had gag a maggot. Yeah. but i still yeah. can't choke down liver yeah it yeah. is it's pretty gross i can't i can't stomach uh sardines i just look at that i see the can i just almost start to to vomit just looking at the can but anyway that's 
you know, <laughs> not, not, not for this show, but both of you have, so Rico, you've got a daughter too, you know, yep. you both have daughters. So how son. are you, and, a, and you've got your son as well. Um, how do you find it now? Do you find that you've brought some of those traits or have you loosened the reins on what your dads did to the, uh, how they brought the two of you up? I'll start with you, Rico. Well, no, I, when I raised, you know, my, uh, my stepson and stuff, I, I brought my father's values with me and he was raised like that mm -hmm. sometimes to the discontent of the wife at that time. But I would explain my actions. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you don't set boundaries now, you're not going to be able to set them when they get older. Right. You teach them when they're young, mm -hmm. you know, that these are boundaries and uh, I ended up having to raise my grandchild and, uh, I set up boundaries, but the the wife at that time wanted to be more like the child's friend mm -hmm. instead of a parent. Mm -hmm. And I told her the boundary thing. And I told her, you watch when she gets older, you're not going to get respected. Mm -hmm. So until she was 18, which is this last June, she's, you know, I treated her as a parent. Okay. And to this day, she respects me. Mm -hmm. and doesn't cross that line with the ex the ex is calling me sometimes going Why do you got to do something about her i said uh no i don't have to you do mm -hmm. i already have my relationship established with her she knows what to do and what not to do how far she can push her little tantrums and when to back off mm -hmm. so i just echoed my father yeah and what about you paul with your daughter yeah, I mean that about the, along the same lines. As far as she gets it, she understands mm -hmm. uh, very strong on respect. Uh, brought her up tough, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I I believe I believe um, as much as I believe in God. I believe that uh, people uh, take kindness as a weakness. Mm -hmm. Most people, I mean, um, not everybody, but most people. And also one thing because she's a gymnast. Um, I, I told her from a very, very young age, probably like six years old, and I drilled it into her head. I said, you know, you're going to fall. You're going to get hurt. Um, you're going to fall on the beam, off the beam, get hurt. Um, but don't let people see you cry. Yeah. And I, I just kept drilling that into her head. I said, because, you know, they take that as a weakness. Mm -hmm. And that makes them feel better about themselves, whether I'm right or wrong or not um you know in their eyes it was mm -hmm. right in my eyes and i saw her split the beam one day and she came out of class she had her use the uh, little girls room um and she she came over to me and i said you okay and she goes it hurt really bad daddy she goes but i didn't cry i said no you didn't mm -hmm. and that was what she was proud of that she didn't cry yeah. and over the years it became the norm yeah. and she's just tough really really tough yeah and she has respect for everybody mm -hmm. she gets it mm -hmm. um at 16 she gets it mm -hmm. i see people out in the world today they don't get it yeah i mean they're they're fruit fruit cakes as as you know i mean really seriously i mean this is how you act amongst your peers mm -hmm. i mean stand up and, and a lot of people are afraid to even give their own opinion anymore yeah yeah. That's where the culture went. That's why, as Rico and I were saying, and you and Mario could attest to, in the Italian family, the way you're brought up is A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. That is it. Those are the things that matter. And then after that, eh, we'll get to discuss that later. Yeah. But this is the these are the rules you stand by. Yeah. And that's that's gone in the American culture. Mm -hmm. It just really is. I mean. Do you see respect when you go out there? You see people holding doors for other people. No, well, yeah. so I to call me back a little later. I'm on a podcast. It's very, very <laughs> odd. Yeah, yeah, it's very, very strange. Um, the 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 way that you know when I hear you two gentlemen, I don't even see it as a bad thing. And I think that's the way that the media has portrayed this is that the way you and I and we were all raised was bad because it was too aggressive. It was you know coming back to something. The uh, Rico, Paul, and I talked about the other day, which was toxic masculinity. It's mm -hmm. a word that's been thrown around, which I don't really think they've done their research to find out exactly what that means. 
I thought Paul's analogy of it was pretty excellent. He said, I think it's actually in reverse when a man doesn't hold a door, when a man doesn't pay, when a man can't be bothered, when he just, you know, doesn't want to go the extra mile, you know? Chivalry is gone. It's almost all gone. I do that to this day. My dad taught me that, and I do it to this day. Even for strangers, if I see a a woman coming, I'll hold the door. I don't care if she's 30 feet away, and then she'll start to ride. Take your time, ma'am. Yeah. Take your time. Yeah. And you know, it's a I open car doors. Mm-hmm. You know, I put them in, I even give them the seat belt before I even shut the door. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. just just that's why the way I'm wired. That's the way I was brought up. And that's what the Italian family does also teach you to respect your elders. Mm-hmm. I mean, the older, like your grandpa, great grandpa, you had to respect them. If you yeah. didn't, bada bing, bada boom. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there was no no such thing as called time out. Yeah. It's another thing. Another thing. Sorry, Rico there, but I felt passionate to jump in. That's another thing too, about some of some, not all some, but the younger generation. Now they'll be so bold as to come up to someone who's two, three times their age and make fun. I would never in a million years when I was a teenager ever dare speaking up to someone in their 20s 30s or 40s or 50s you know not would i dare i had that inbuilt respect so it's almost like a common sense that's kind of evading a lot of it seems like common sense is just dwindling you know it's it's it, never, listen it's basic it, manners it, is dwindling yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's the family it's the upbringing look i, I may get in trouble for them saying this or at least maybe some you know talk back but you know it is what it is i have a neighbor who's an elderly woman and if i walk outside or i see her wherever i'm out uh and she's taking in groceries or whatever the case may be or whatever i always ask her if she needs help if she's taking in groceries i grab them i bring them into her house for her Mm -hmm. that's just what i i do yet on the other side of me i have a family with three young kids and they get everything delivered to them, mm-hmm. even even bags of food. And they will sit out on their porch for hours. Yet the boys are in the house. They don't even bother coming out and taking them in. Because that's the culture. The mother doesn't tell them, you need to do this. You need to do that from the get-go. Mm-hmm. So now they feel, you know what? Eh, let it stay out there. Mm-hmm. Packages stay out there all day. They'll put their garbage out on on their on their what we call a porch, and it'll sit there. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's one of their other kids' turns, mm-hmm. but at the end of the day, should it be that way? It's there. It's garbage, or it's there and it's food. Mm-hmm. Don't you think it's going to go bad in the sun or whatever the case may be? Yeah. You don't even bother come out and pick it up. Yeah, yeah. So I know they're not helping anybody else mm-hmm. if, if somebody's in in need. Uh-huh. of help and there's where the culture starts to fall back my daughter will go and dad i'm gonna go help that person go on i'll yeah. watch it go on go mm-hmm. yeah she's 16 and a, and, a, and a female yeah which by the way she identifies as a female yep there you go that's good that's yeah, always that's a good, good thing that's a very good yeah. thing yeah. um yeah yeah it's uh it's 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 remarkable it is a subject the, you know, obviously, I think we all feel passionate about because the future is important. And we'll yeah. take this moment just to remind you all 2024 elections are coming up hot and heavy. This episode goes out today, Friday, November 1st. It's Tuesday, November the 5th. Those ballots need to be in. Make sure you cast your vote. And just like we said the other day, pray on it. If you are a believer, pray first and utilize, you know, your your discernment on who you think should be president of the United States, because we are all proud Americans here. You know, I became an American. Obviously, these two gentlemen are American by birth, but I became an American. I'm very proud of this country, as we are all here on Power and Glory. One of the things I wanted to also talk about, gentlemen, um, still talking about the culture, the Italian and Sicilian culture, which will lead... I got to- my Welch's sparkling apple cider. <laughs> Gosh, Rico. 2024. My gosh, Rico. <sighs> Looks like you're in your own private restaurant there. Well, you are. He's living He's living the dream. I'm is, living the dream. He is living the dream. He tells me this is uh, Chateau Rico. Chateau Rico. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. 
<laughs> this is where he dwells, ladies and gentlemen, part time. Um, as we go into the next topic, we know that the Italians and the Sicilians have good morals and ethics, but then we also know that you know along the way the there were the mobs that 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 formed, but yet they still hold these same principles though of honoring this chain of command and respect and discipline. So do you, any of you know the history of the mobs, how they formed, how they came to be? And in your interpretation, you know, what what was the objectives when they first started? What was the objectives of the mob? Who wants to well, take it first? Rika? Well, from what I understand, and uh, I've been around a lot of the families. My dad was an entertainer. And he was on the Ed Sullivan show a few times and he opened the main acts at the Stardust and at the Desert Inn. So uh, I've kissed more right hand ring fingers and knew more guys with the middle name the than I can even remember. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it, it started in Sic Sicily, okay. the, the mafia, or whatever you want to call it, the family. And then it just branch branched over and then came to America organized and they went into five families and um they did bookmaking that was basically it the mob was as i understand never about drug scene mm -hmm. those were those were factions and and knockoffs mm -hmm. they they did gambling loan sharking uh vegas you know what they did took the skim mm -hmm. you know that movie casino is pretty accurate i was here in those days mm -hmm. um uh, with uh, Spalatro and uh, Lefty and stuff like that. Uh, my half brother was a Mater D, the Stardust, in the main showroom at 21. And that, and anytime you got like a valet job, a, a, a host for a room, you had to get juiced in. Mm. Everything was about who you knew, not what you knew. Yeah. And that's about what I know in Vegas, like I said. And I've never had a bad experience mm -hmm. with anybody who was in that lifestyle, pleasant, mm -hmm. you know. In fact, um, my godfather is a godfather, was a godfather. Wow. Uh, Jimmy Durani was my late brother's godfather. Okay. So that's the kind, I mean, I was around it. It was just normal. Yeah. And when Vegas was run by them, it was a heck of a lot better town. It wasn't crime. Really? Really? No. The mob stuck within itself. They did what they did, and people who joined, they knew what consequences were. Mm -hmm. It never spilled out into the street. It never mm -hmm. became a drive-by shooting or something. If you were targeted, they made sure that person was taken care of, but quietly. So, so, So the movies is a big exaggeration, and from what you're telling me, if I were to go back, because you always, I'm always trying to figure out what started, what was the nucleus. So if we were to go back, we would say that this was a group of people that really wanted to try and enforce and govern a people. Uh, perhaps they were rebelling against the the quote unquote system, but they were going to try and contain everything within an order that they controlled, rather than allowing the you know the mainstream to control it. Would you well say? Well, we came in as immigrants first, mm -hmm. you know, so we had to stick together. The Italians had to stick together. Right. Tony, jump in any time. You called him Tony. I mean, Paul. Paul. I'm think, sorry. My brother, thinking, his name's what? Tony. Yeah, listen, listen, everybody <laughs> calls me Tony. Tony yeah. Roma. Bruno San Martino called me Tony for the longest time. Yeah. I don't Paul, even bother but... correcting anybody. It's okay. <laughs> no. But no, I, I think it. It developed the, the family system to protect their own people right. because they were getting trounced on. Okay. And then protection and then uh, when the law wouldn't handle things for them, you know, um, that unity, like if they got in hard times with money and stuff like that, it was like a like a inner circle mm -hmm. it wasn't to go against society. It was to protect their culture, okay. their own people who couldn't. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what do you think paul no i agree and I, I you know i mean there was the irish mafia too yeah you know back in the day and and you know they wanted what was best for the irish people and you couldn't blame them and same with the italians they wanted what was best for the italian people so 
again, um, they were looking out for one another and, and people that wanted to infiltrate or, or cause damage, they, um, for lack of a better word, would deal with them. Mm -hmm. You know, um, without incriminating myself, I knew of some people. I hung out with those people and I was very safe, mm -hmm. you know, with those people. It, they were um, they were good people as far as I was concerned. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know they, they had some some bad sides, but everybody had the bad side, mm -hmm. you know, for the yeah. most part. Um, but again, at the end of the day, it was a family. Yeah. It was a big family that just branched out. Um, the Irish were no different. We, I mean, even if you look today, how many different, and they may not even be around anymore. I'm sure they are, but you have the Russian mafia, right? You have the Irish mafia, you have the Italian mafia, but now you Yakuza, don't hear about- Japanese mafia. Yeah, mm -hmm. Japanese, yeah. You don't hear about, about it that much anymore as I did growing up. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it came from my father's mouth too. Yeah. And I'm sure it did Rico's dad. Oh yeah. He yeah. would tell me prior to me meeting anybody, this is so and so, this is what you do. And this the and I I I had the rundown before I even met. Or I'm gonna go do a show in Palm Springs, so and so's coming. I'm gonna introduce you to him, blah 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 blah. You, you know, do this. Rico, when when the Godfather first aired when it first came out here in Connecticut, the Italians bought out a movie theater. They were because they didn't want anybody to see that movie because they said, we are not like that. Right. right. You know what I mean? That's yeah. how adamant against uh, the Godfather they were. Yeah. It was crazy. I kept saying, you can't keep buying these movie theaters out. People right. are going to see it. That's it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So and they it was one, one of the best motion picture in the history. First one was the best one. Not in fact, one. the guy that gets strangled at the end uh -huh. in the car, his name's Johnny, Johnny Russo. I was friends with him through my father. And he had a restaurant here and everything. And we went to his hotel room. We were in California when he was filming The Godfather. Yeah. That, that's pretty and cool. yeah. So I was around it. Yeah, you know, and Johnny Russo played that part where he he uh, snitched out Sonny, and yeah. then Michael had to okay, but see how they did it. Okay, you just go to Vegas, you stay there, don't come back. Thank yeah. you, thank yeah. you. Sits in the front seat, and all of a sudden, adios, muchacho. But but totally not like you were saying though, Paul. Totally not what it's about. They got it wrong because otherwise they didn't. You know why would they be buying out the movie theaters to stop them from seeing it? Because it, it did put right. a very violent, stone cold, you know. I mean, they were they were the epitome uh, the Italian of, culture. Yeah, that's what they yeah, right? what they put on. Right. It. Yeah, I mean, it, it really did categorize the Italians as being as being you know mob murderers and oh, you know, oh yeah, don't definitely cross them. definitely cast the stereotype upon the Italian. Yeah. It's a, it just just plop pinned it on us. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. I mean, and, and I, when I was in Chicago, wrestling in Chicago, I ran into a group of guys, um, became friends with them. They were there at the uh, hotel all the time. And we got to talking. And one of the guys said, hey, we'd like to come to your show. And I was like, yeah, sure. No problem. Now, mind you, I had hurt my knee and it was swollen. And I was down in the, the gym area and he was there and he said, uh, I was rubbing my knee and he goes, what's wrong with your knee? I said, well, I heard it. It's all swollen. He goes, you need to see a doctor? I said, yeah, I'd like to, but I don't know any. He goes, hold on. He makes a phone call. He says, go see this doctor. Here's the address. Um, he goes, do you need a ride there? I said, no, no, I'll get a ride. He says, just mention your name. You'll get right in. And I did. I walked up. It was, there was a, a you know room full of people waiting, patients. And I walked up, gave him my name, and as soon as he was done with that patient, he took me right in, took mm -hmm. care of me. I went back. I thanked the gentleman. Um, so he wanted to come to the show. And then he said to me, he wants to walk me to the ring. Well, now, that's not my call, right? But what I did find out, which I was gracefully told, that they run Chicago. 
him and his boys. I had no reason to doubt him. So, especially after the first little incident. Mm -hmm. So we go to the arena and they come into the back room, so to speak. And one of the agents walks up to me and he says, uh, you know, those guys. And I said, yeah, I know them. He goes, well, they got to go. And I Mm -hmm. said, well, I said, well, why don't you go tell them that they have to go? Because I'm not telling them that. And he looks at me. I said, they built this place. That was the Rosemont Horizon. So he was like, what? And I told him the story. And he goes, okay. I said, oh, and by the way, they want to walk me to the ring. You don't have a problem with that either, do you? And he's like, nope, whatever they want. I said, you got that right. So they did. They walked me out to the ring. Um, And now we get done. And he says he wants to take me. He's going to take me get the best pizza, you know, blah, blah, blah. So we stop by this bar and, and restaurant. So we walk in and he says, I'm, I'm standing at the bar with him. And he says to me, I have to go take care of something. I'll be right back. Get something to drink. Now, I wasn't a drinker, but I would always order like a cranberry juice. So it looked like I was drinking, right? They put a little straw in there and it looks like you're having a mixed drink. So he walks away. And I said to the bartender, female bartender, and I said, uh, excuse me. I said, uh, can I get a uh, cranberry juice? She goes, do you want anything in it? And I said, no. And she made a snotty remark to me. Hmm. And I was like, wow. Well, that I was taken back by that. So he comes out. He comes back. And he looks at me and he goes, something wrong? And I went, yeah. I said, I, you know, I asked her for a cranberry juice. And she made, and I told him the remark she made. And he goes, really? I go, yeah. He goes, come on. We'll go, we'll go get it somewhere else. I said, okay. So he tells them they pull his car up. He goes, I'll be right back. Mm-hmm. So he walks back in. He comes back out and he goes, yeah, I had her fired. And I was like, what? He goes, nobody disrespects my friend. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wow, yeah. the culture is still alive. Wow. And that right there shows you that that's the respect that the Italians had for not, you know, one another and their friends mm-hmm. and, and and what they wanted from the restaurant that they're running. Right. They, they don't need you to get snotty with somebody or make a wise crack to somebody you don't know. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's not right. I mean, that's not good business. Yeah. It, it's something that needs to be done. I mean, we're not advocating that, you know, all of our viewers suddenly become, you know, uberly aggressive when something goes wrong. That's not what we're advocating at all, but it's community, it's communication, you know, uh, too many people, far too many people nowadays are afraid that if they say one thing wrong, that that person's going to fall into a a pit of depression and et cetera, et cetera. Now, yes, if you purposely decide to say something negative to someone that you know is going to hurt them, yes, you could send them cascading down that, um, that road. But If you're just responding to something and somebody takes it the wrong way and goes into a depression, that's not on you. That that is not that is not on you. And no one on Earth should walk around with that sort of a guilt complex at all. Um, uh, Rico and obviously viewers bringing you back up to speed. So for new viewers and we want to thank all the new viewers and subscribers to our network. We greatly appreciate it. But Paul was a part of WWF before it was WWE in the uh, mid 80s early 80s throughout the 80s 90s and then he went to wcw rico debuted in the wwe in the very early i think it's 2001 right we at rico 2000 i was signed in 99 to developmental signed and in 99. I, right between 2000 2001 i appeared on the main roster appeared on the main roster and was there till about what 2006 rico no no uh five 2005 we were both five. I, I formerly was gone one, one year shy there. So you both grew up in different, very different time periods. Oh, yes. So, so as I said, Paul's telling us a story now uh, of what happened in the 80s. But now you were in a much different time, Rico. So you're in the 2000s now. Things are becoming a little bit more censored, people a little bit more touchy. But while you were there, did you get? did you ever get the impression? Because Paul brought this up to me a few weeks ago when we did the Vince McMahon special. Did you ever get the impression that maybe the Irish, let's call them the mob, 
had anything to do with it. Did you feel any of those presences in WWE? Any heavy hitters along the way that may have been? No, no, I, I've never, I never felt an outside. The only force I felt was Vince McMahon's oppression. Okay. That cloud <laughs> that he put over the whole arena. Yeah. So everybody would listen to him. You know, that, that's what I felt. I didn't feel any, any of that stuff, any, anything, any mob related. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel like somebody was, getting strong armed or anything yeah because it was uh, good no go ahead go ahead well i just like i said it's just vince's normal him being him and the how he wants to be you know the best at everything you yeah. know and wants to keep you in line so he uses that that threat of you getting released because you're independent contractor keeps that looming over your head yeah very stressful to have to yeah. look like that but but Paul, so the difference between those two generations, though, we know that Paul, I mean, viewers, just take a moment to look at Paul right now. All right. He's a tough guy. All right. So just remember that. But the guys back in the 80s were just like that, Paul. Yeah, they all had that same kind of drive, that motivation and everything else. Rico, you were still part of that. But having said that, when you were there, Rico, Things had started to change. And I think there were some other guys there who, like, if I was a kid looking at Paul and the guys back in the 90s, I would have been, oh, I'm not going to mess with them. Well, and yeah, it, they looked apart. Yeah, they Definitely. looked apart, but they acted the part. These guys yes. were tough. So, yeah. but, but then in the 2000s, you started getting these other characters come in who were not, you know, I mean, what was the, what were the, what, describe your locker room to Paul. So he can and he can tell you the differences. So in the early 2000s, what was a typical day like? Were there any you know, bitter rivalries, anger, blackmailing? I'm going to get your spot. What, what was it like? Tell oh, Paul. never like that. Uh, uh, we did four days. I'm Paul in your day. You probably worked twice as much as that. Uh, yeah, we did when 23, I day, 23 days a month. Wow. So, uh, you know, we did three house shows and a television taping, or it was uh, two house shows, a pay-per-view, and then a TV taping, you know, once a month. Uh, locker room, everybody was basically professional. If there was some underlying causes, which there was, of people, because you got more TV time than they got, or you were getting pushed harder than, yeah, but it was not out in the open. Nobody did it. They did it behind your back. Mm -hmm. and stuff like that and they were nice to your face so um uh the locker rooms everybody you know we had catering food you know and then we got to go out there and you know warm up our bodies and just bounce around the ring a little bit mm -hmm. and if you've never worked with somebody before you try to get their finisher down if they're going over so you know how to take it so you don't hurt mm -hmm. get hurt or you don't hurt the other guy you okay. take care of each other so you'll be able to work the next day okay so yeah, the locker rooms were just it was just like business guys getting together. And then we'd all meet at the lunch and then we'd all, you know, run around and until we started getting ready for the show, you know, yeah. taping a Sunday night heat and then going right into the pay-per-view. So, you know? so so the difference already I can pick up there is as Paul told me, you know, uh the other member of Power and Glory, the tag team Power and Glory, Hercules, the first time they met. Am I right, Paul? Her, uh, Ray looked at you and did this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we uh, we landed in Australia, yeah. and SD Jones and I were coming off the plane, and they had already sat down, grab a bite to eat. Um, you know, because they had the like the little restaurant sitting on the side as you're walking through the terminal. And he gave me the old cut my throat, and that's when I looked at SD and I go, "Is he?" Talking to you, he goes, "No, that was for you." And I said, "Why well, I me? Mean, I don't even know him." You know what I mean? He goes, "He wants to cut your throat." I said, "I didn't do anything to the guy," you know. Um, and then we become family. I mean, really crazy. Uh, the difference between uh, Rico, your locker room, and ours was we we got food at a big event. Yeah, that's uh, what we like, do. Big event. We got a food at big right. events. So on a like a obviously uh thanksgiving day you know they oh. had a big event so okay we they would bring in food um as far as our locker room it was more like this they looked out for one another 
when somebody came in from the outside, from another federation, um, they didn't take too kindly to them. They watched them. I mean, watched them under a microscope. Uh, and a lot of guys that came in from other organizations from the South, they would torture. Right. So if they went to the ring, they'd come back and their suit that they wore would be short sleeved and shorts. Wouldn't be slacks anymore, it'd be shorts. Um, these guys were able to, you, you know, the Halliburton suitcases, mm-hmm, they yeah. have a, they, they have a, a, a lock on it, you know, combination lock, three mm-hmm. different numbers. Well, these guys had a way of getting into them. And if they didn't get into them by using the, the lock and trying all different numbers while the guy's in the ring, then they just jump on it, cave the thing in. And that's the way they'd open it up. Um, so yeah, they poisoned the well for the most part. And you had to watch your stuff and they would not so much rib you, mm-hmm. but you'd come back from the ring and somebody may have said that you said something about somebody and they believed it because they were very gullible, these guys. You'd yeah. think they wouldn't have been, but a lot of them were. And then there may be something done to your your clothes or whatever the case may be. And then you got to decide, do you open your mouth or do you tuck your tail between your legs? grab your stuff, go about your business, and then leave. And that was the lesser of the two evils. So while you could stand in the locker and say, okay, who did this to my stuff? We're going to fight right now. That's the rise they wanted to get out of you. Mm -hmm. If you didn't do that, and this is how it was explained to me by Mr. Fuji, if you didn't do that, you take your stuff, act like nothing happened, and then leave. Mm -hmm. And then go to the arena the next day. And now that you didn't get a rise, they're not going to bother doing it to you again. But if you get a, they get a rise out of you, the next night, it's going to be worse. Yeah. And yeah. the night after that, it's going to get worse again. Yeah. Because they're going to keep going and going because they, they're loving life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't know who's doing it. And you're basically, for, for lack of a better word, you know, threatening everybody. Mm-hmm. But everybody just sits there and looks at you like you're nuts. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't cut your pants. Yeah. I didn't do this. I didn't do that. So, um, yeah, you kept your mouth shut. And again, it was little things uh, for the most part. Mm-hmm. But when I look back at the grand scheme of things, yes, there were a lot of guys that I had respect for, mm-hmm. quite a few, quite a few that I didn't, um, that were just not to be trusted, just scumbags all in it for themselves. Uh, but as I said, when I look back, they were, they were a lot of tough guys, mm. but a lot of them weren't as tough as they thought they were. Mm. Mm. They lived off of their persona that they portrayed mm-hmm. in that ring. Yeah. And what they didn't ever tell themselves was you're not that tough. Yeah. You know what I mean? They, they wanted to carry themselves like that. There were a couple guys, hands down, mm. you're going to go to war with. It's a war. Mm-hmm. You're gonna fight them. You're in a war. Paul, and, let me. It may be a short one. Let me. Let me ask you: Was Rick Rude one of those individuals? Because he always seemed like he's a tough guy backstage. Rick Rick Rude was a really nice guy. Mm-hmm. Um, I heard he was tough. Mm-hmm. I never saw it. People didn't mess with him. Yeah. So you know, same thing with Don Morocco, mm-hmm. or or Cowboy Bob Orton. Yeah. You know, there are two guys that were supposed to be really tough. Mm-hmm. I've seen. Bob Orton moved some weight around that, you know, I was shocked Looked at him going, wow, brother, he moved some weight. Then I see Morocco move way around. I'm like, okay, I'm not surprised. Right. I mean, look at the contrast in the body types. Yeah. Right. So yeah. one surprises you, one doesn't surprise you, even, even though it's still strong. You know what I'm saying? It, it just doesn't surprise. Like if the warrior goes and benches 500 pounds, you go, okay, I expected that. Yeah. But then you see, you know, uh, Lombardi going over 500 pounds, you know, yeah. Steve Lombardi. And then you go, yeah, well, something's not right here. Yeah. You know, there must've been jacks under that thing. Yeah. So, you know, that, that's what I mean by, by that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we could be on there all day about guys that you didn't, that I didn't trust and yeah. wouldn't trust and wouldn't give a dollar to because you'd never get it back. It's just, it just seems like there was obviously more of a hostile working condition at that time. Like you're, you it was were, stressful. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I I could I could just 
by watching you tell the story, I knew it was more stressful then, but it was stress from yeah. within. You, mm. you, don't, you yes. think your stuff's yes. safe? Yes. Stress from within. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and I, that's yeah. why when I went to WCW, it was laid back. I sat in the locker room. I go, this is it? Oh, my word. If I start playing ribs on these guys, they're not going to know what to do. They're a bunch of sheep. And I feel like the big bad wolf that just walked in. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas back at WWF, <clears throat> they're all wolves back yeah. there. Yeah. But I, the, my saving grace, all joking, my saving grace um, was, yes, my attitude. Uh, they were unsure of what my capabilities were as far as how tough I was. Mm. They saw me in the gym, how strong I was. They kind of felt out my attitude about how tough I was. And, and then when uh, they found out that my trainer was Mr. Fuji, that eliminated anybody thinking that they were going to even test me yeah, because nobody went against Mr. Fuji. So, and since I was his product, they weren't going to test that product. Yeah. yeah. That's the respect everybody had for Mr. Fuji. Yeah. Did yes. you get to meet him, Rico? Yeah. No, I didn't get to meet him. Yeah. Got to watch him. Yeah. No, he was definitely a tough as nails guy, but Rico now more recently, you were now in the AEW locker room. So out of oh, all, yeah. You're the only one who's been in that locker room. So tell us now you've got a 19 year gap from the last time you were in. Well, no, not 19 years. What is it? Six, six, 17 years, 18 years. I can't do the math. No, it's 19 years. Yeah. You would have 19 years. Yeah. So, semantics. Semantics. Yeah. So, um, so what was the biggest difference? Now we've heard of Paul's generation. We've heard of the two thousands. Tell us now what is going on backstage now? What is the well, major contract? I I had the same feeling as Paul walked into WCW. What? Because the locker room AEW is just wonderful. Everybody gets along. Everybody talks. They they meet at catering. They're friends. There's you don't see any animosity. And that cloud, Tony Khan, does not put that cloud on the arena. Oh, that's uh, wonderful. Oh my God! I mean, he's there doing things. He's involved, mm -hmm. but there's no oppression or that thickness in the air you know when i would do promos and read tapes for wwe they'd hand me a script and say i had to say these words you know well that's kind of hard for you to bounce into a character if you gotta sure. read word for word yeah. so sure. i go to aew and we're gonna do a pre-tape because it's a hush hush that i'm coming that I, then nobody knows that i'm coming to be an mxm collective's corner so we they go well, let's do a, a rehearsal okay so we do the rehearsal da 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 and uh, the guy goes the guy who's in charge of the pre goes that's great do that again I said do what again he goes well do that just what you did I said <laughs> I said I don't know what I did <laughs> changes all the yeah. time I said I just winged it he says yeah. well wing it again yeah. so we did it and on the second take we got it and we just did a third one just for the heck of it. Yeah. And uh, we did it and it went good. And then uh, he said, let's do one more just in case. Okay. He goes, well, do what you did. I said, I'm going to tell you again. I don't even know what I said. And I just said it two minutes ago. Yeah. Yeah. But it, but it does. Then, it did, doesn't it it happen relaxed. like that. Yeah. It happens. It like was that. relaxed. And then I did a post. Yeah. And we had to do that a couple times because one time a security guard was sitting in the way and the lighting wasn't right for the guy. And I just told him, he goes, that was great, great. And I said, don't tell me to say the same thing because I don't know what I said. <laughs> I said, so every time you're going to get a different version of what I'm going to say, but it's going to be on point. Yeah. yeah. But it was so relaxing and it was not so much pressure. I just went out and was Rico the stylist when I was doing the, pre the post tape. Yeah. This is what Rico the stylist would do. And I just went out and just concentrated on my facial features and, and involving the guys and not worrying about what I had to say, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, uh, boy. And I tell you the most stressful one was when I had to do the Billy and Chuck wedding. Oh, that was, that was 2002. So Paul, yeah. Paul, I don't know if you're familiar with this. Are you familiar that they put Rico in an angle with two guys, Billy Gunn and Chuck Palumbo, and they were supposed to be infringing upon whether they were homosexual or not. Let's just say that. And then Rico was supposed to force them to get married. On wait, wait, was this AEW? WWE. No, this was WWE. No, WWE. WWE. Yeah, yeah. Well, that makes sense. But go on. 
Yeah. So WWE. Yeah. So he was. So he was telling the story of that. So I'm going to throw it back to you. I was just explaining that. Right. About twenty twenty three years ago now. Yeah, it happened twenty. Yeah, but they gave me four pages to memorize because every time I said something or did something, it would trigger something, yeah. and that was the most stressful I was, and the longest oh. promo I ever cut because it went. It was basically live. Yeah, the that's tape was back down, but it, but there was no. You couldn't stop in the middle of it and do another take. No, so it had no. to be boom, 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 boom. And that was the most stressed I ever was in wrestling, is yeah. having to do the wedding. And, and back in my day, it was ad lib. Yeah. It's off the cuff. Yeah. You know, hey, listen, you're going to be at this arena at this day, this time. That's all you have to say. The rest is yours. Okay, go. Mm -hmm. And then the guy would say, you know, hey, when I see you in Knoxville, Tennessee, at the such and such arena at seven o'clock, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, it has to be a minute or two minutes or whatever it is. Once they give you that sign and they count you down, you're done. That's yeah. it. End the story. Yeah. But when I heard that you guys had to memorize lines, I'm saying to myself, oh, my Lord, how do you do that? Then I heard guys were practicing their entire matches in the ring, I said, Oh my lord, how do you do that? Yeah, and then and replicate it again. We it was it was on the fly with us, it was easier, you yeah, because you didn't have to remember things. And then I went to a um a show and I was wrestling in the show, and the gentleman came up to me and he says, Okay, so this is what I'd like to do. And I went, excuse me, and he goes, This is what I would like to do. And I went, What are you talking about? And he started telling me, well, I want to do this and this and this. And then you can do this and this and this. And then I will do this and this. And I went, no, no, no <laughs> that, that's not how I work. Yeah. So all joking aside, I call, I said, are you reffing my match? And the guy said, yeah. I said, come over here. I said, tell him everything you want to do. So he did. And I walked away. So in the match, I said to referee, what's next? Because I don't know what this guy wants to do, right? Yeah. So yeah. he would say, oh, this. I'm like, okay, have him do that. And this, okay, have him do that. And then but, when it was my turn, I just called it on, on the fly. Yeah, but it, it, wouldn't it be more robotic like that? If you're, if you're going, so what you're saying, what, do. what you're saying, Paul, what you're saying, Rico, is back then, even in the Ruthless Aggression era, you guys would just be on the fly. You kind of talk about, okay, I'm going to go over, you're going to lose uh, maybe let's hit this this point here. If we if we're gonna do a disqualification, this is a few steps that lead up to it. But you didn't map out every single detail. Not no. at the house shows. Not in the house shows. But I tell you what, everybody that I work with, we mapped it out for television events. Be the finish. We started. Yeah, not the house shows. Okay. But we we fly that, you know, because it's a house show. But mm -hmm. Vince was a stickler for time, and we worked the match backwards we work from the end to the beginning mm -hmm. so we and they say you know because the, the, they'd be timing the ref would have an earpiece in his head and let's say we needed two minutes for the go home spot mm -hmm. so the ref would say okay go home and then we knew to go into that mode and that had to be precise for tv that's the way vince wanted it there was yeah. no calling on the fly okay no call yeah see for, so for our tv um we had to know the finish. We had to know the time limit. And basically, this is how crazy it was. So we're in the back, and Ray and I, Hercules and I, and they say, we say, okay, these are two guys you're working with. Okay, fine. So how long do we have? You have five minutes. Oh, good. So they announce the guys. They send them out to the ring, and then they announce us. Here comes the big hoopila. We go out there. Get in the ring. Obviously, the ref is there. One of us has to step out. The ref says, okay, you got two minutes. Go home. Okay. You just told us we had five. Mm -hmm. Now you just told us two. So we had two minutes. So I just turned to Ray and I go, we got two minutes. So we beat the guys up. We hit them with our finish. Two minutes is done. We go back to the locker room. Hey, sorry that that happened. But we had, no, we know we're supposed to have five. We only had two. Okay, couldn't give you anything. Mm -hmm. uh, in the house shows, the reasoning, uh, even in pay-per-views, all we cared about was, again, the finish mm -hmm. um, and how much time that you wanted. Is there anything particular you, you want us to do? If you think about this, 
when you're in house shows, when let's say let's say you're number one mm-hmm. and and I'm I'm the second match or mm-hmm. I'm the third match, and you say uh, and you go out there and you wrestle for however long it, it takes you, mm-hmm. right? Whatever the time limit is. So yeah. now you go out there and you're working the arm. You're working the guy's arm. Okay. And now we're next. Well, I was going to work my guy's arm. Well, I can't do that. So now I got to pick another body part to work. I can't yep. work work your arm. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense mm-hmm. to work your arm. So these guys today, the guy before him works the arm. Match number two works the arm. Your match number three, you work the arm. It's the same thing. The only yeah. difference is they're in different garb. Yeah. And they're different people, but they're working the same body part. So people are looking, going, I just saw this match twice already. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I will say in WWE, like for the more, uh, the later matches, they would say, okay, no chops because Rick's going to be out there or they're going to do chops. No choking on the rope because this match is going to do it. The road agents did get together with everybody and they said, okay, uh, work the neck. Or work the leg, uh, work the back. He's working the arm. Yeah, so they did do that, even in house shows and television. Uh, they the road agents got together and they said, "Okay, what do you go? What are you working? What's your guys working? What's your guys working?" And they would tell them so we wouldn't replicate it. Okay. So, so Rico, so here's the difference for the fans out there. Here's the that's beautiful that he said that because here's the difference in our era. Because we watch the match before us Mm -hmm. or the matches before us. And we knew whatever, like you'd never go out there and and do this Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. Hogan did. You wouldn't go out there and shake the ropes. We knew not to do anything. Like Mike Sharp, his big thing was chopping you. Yeah. So no one would chop anybody before Mike Sharp's match. Okay. Okay. So you didn't have to be told because out of respect, you knew. So I knew what Rico's certain thing was, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Whatever that may be. So if Rico was shaking the ropes, I knew not to shake those ropes because that's Rico's thing. Yeah. If it was doing a super kick, I knew not to do a super kick because that was Rico's thing. Yeah. And so on and so on and so on. Yeah. It's almost like having like Jake the Snake. I wouldn't walk out with a snake. That Jake the Snake had the snake. Right. I mean, you follow what I'm saying, though? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's really along those lines. A move and you definitely, or a gimmick. you definitely don't do a DDT in any of the matches if yeah. Jake's wrestling. Anyway. Right. You, you don't do for his matches. finisher. Yeah. Because it's his finish. Correct. Yeah. And that, and that comes back to a loss of common sense. If you watch Correct. somebody do this, you don't follow suit. And I think that's one of the, the nagging issues that has been popping up on many podcasts and I've talked to you two gentlemen about it, is the lack of distinction between one character from the next these days. The wrestlers, uh, the match styles are all seeming to fuse into one style. Uh, I was talking to, we had on our guest, in fact, Paul, last week, we had on Chris Masters, who will be a guest on here soon on Power and Glory. Uh, Chris was telling us, you know, the difference between if you're a big guy with a big frame, if you're a muscle guy, you're not going to go and do flips and hurricane runners and, you know, jumping and doing backflips. 720s. On. Yeah, you're not going to do that. In fact, um, there was that one time when Sid Vicious jumped off the top rope. And I think I read uh-huh. somewhere that he didn't want to. And he it, it, his... it, it wasn't. I don't believe it was. The, I thought it was the second rope. Wasn't it the second rope, Rico? Oh, yeah, maybe. Where he second. broke his ankle? Yeah. Uh, his, his, well, his shin. I think it wasn't his yeah. shin that shattered. Shin. shin or something. It was bad. Yeah. I know his yeah. leg went the other way. It was so I can't even watch it. Yeah. <laughs> no, me neither. And I can watch a lot of stuff. I yeah. know. That was bad, man. But there was a prime example, again, of you're going outside of, of who you are. And I think that's one of the big... Now, did you notice that, Rico? Did you notice uh, in the AEW matches? Were you watching them all? Did you notice? Oh, yeah. Was there any... Was there as much dis- distinction between the matches as, as in the yes. progression? Okay. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's what, you know, I, you know, I was 
pretty built for a 40 year old being a rookie, you know, but I wasn't as big as a Cena, Triple H, Rock, Brock Lesnar, you know, so I, I focused on entertaining. Yeah. So that's why that stylist character. And then I did an homage to Adrian Street, mm-hmm. you know, with his permission. So um, I will say in AEW, uh, I was impressed because they had that triple threat for their international title. Mm hmm. And the guys actually took their time in the ring. They were telling a story. Ricochet, uh, the holder, and this guy from Japan. And they wasn't bouncing all over the place. It wasn't like a stunt show. If somebody got put through something or a bad move, they rolled away. And then they have taken their time. They didn't just jump up after a hard move. Right, right. You know, and they told the story. Mm-hmm. And then at the end, uh, the Japanese guy put Ricochet like almost like a tombstone type move, but through a table, mm-hmm. which is, just, I mean, just to sound it, but that was it for Ricochet. And mm-hmm. it was these X two guys. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And so Ricochet stayed out and then they told a little bit of a story and then they brought in an interference because that carried to another story, but the Japanese guy ended up winning. But when they each did a big maneuver, they didn't just didn't pop up. They, yeah. they let the people yeah. soak it in. Yeah, yeah, you know, and then they got up accordingly. So I was impressed with the wrestlers there mm-hmm. on well, how they they were telling stories. Well, definitely AEW. You know, Paul and I are big fans of what Tony Khan is doing. Uh, we've expressed that right here on Power and Glory, and of course, I expressed that with you, Rico. You know, when you went into AEW, because I truly, you know, I, I I respect what WWE are doing at this juncture. It seems like they are riding a wave of newfound interest or a renewed interest, let's call it. Um, but there's just something about AEW. Tony Khan has an opportunity to, you know, really do pro wrestling like we knew it yeah. back in the back in the day. He's a huge, you know, huge talent roster. Um, but you know, we, I I'm I won for championing those long form stories. You need to bring that back because you need to develop a fan's reason why they should follow something they need why to- why why they should pay that all that money for a pay-per-view mm-hmm. or spend the, the thousands of dollars for a seat in the arena yeah you know going going back when he's talking about matches mm-hmm. you know if rick flair wasn't on the card you'd get a guy to put a figure four on somebody but it would never he could never win the guy would come, get out of the figure four. Why? Because it wasn't his move. That was Ric Flair's move. Yeah. Yep. You know, if somebody did a frog splash, and and let's just say, let's say Rico does a, a Rico's finishing move is a, a frog splash, right? Mm-hmm. I get up there. He's not at the arena. I do a frog splash. That guy's going to kick out. Why? Because that's not my finishing move. Rico's finishing move. That means he does it perfect yeah. to get the pin. Yeah. Right. And yeah. that's how, you know, we would, I don't want to say steal things, but we would do something that another wrestler did and they wouldn't get mad about it. Yeah. Because yeah. they knew you were doing it out of respect that you weren't going to win with their finishing move. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Today yeah. they all do everybody's moves, but yours is supposed to mean more because, you know, three matches before you gave the DDT and they didn't pin them. But because you gave the DDT, you pinned them. Mm-hmm. No, they shouldn't have even seen it because you're on the card. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> simplicity is key, I think, gentlemen. And I think nowadays simplicity has been thrown out the window and there's complexity all over the place. I just thought as Paul was going over that, Rico, um, and both of you gentlemen, I was thinking all the moves that we used to remember from back then, the perfect plex. The power plex, the the running slam with the British bulldog, the gorilla press with the warrior, the leg drop with Hogan. I can't name any of these guys finishing moves today. I, I can't, and I've watched it, and I cannot tell you for the life of me what they do to finish a match. And I think that needs, as somebody who's watched this industry for many many years, as someone who now participates in this industry, and I've been educated by like everyone you see here, my two co-hosts here from two shows, men who've lived and breathed this for years, decades, we're all coming to the same consensus. You need to slow it down. 
You need to start telling long form stories. You need to define your characters more. Yeah. And I'm saying this to young train wrestlers in training and you need to brand brand is key. And that's what these guys were doing. That's what Paul was doing. That's what power and glory was. It was a brand. Everything they did was unique to them from their costume, to their walk, to their finisher, to the way they did the promos, to the way they interacted with slick. Everything was theirs. Just like everything was Mr. Perfect's. Everything's was Mr. The, the British Bulldog. Everything was Bret Hart. That's what we're missing. We need more yeah. well, individuality. The, the, the problem, Amir, the problem is they're all trying to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. The wheel works. Yeah. Right? I mean, yep. it works. Why? What are you trying to fix about it that's not working? Right. And there lies the problem. Yeah. I think. Go back. Go back. Yeah, go back. You know, like like Paul said, you hit the nail on the head, Paul. The wheel, it wasn't broken. Yes, they amended for the Attitude Era because they were trying to hit a different demographic. But then I think they kept trying to reinvent ever since that time. And like you, it's like, you know, what brought this all to the dance? Was it the scripted promos and the scripted matches? No, because the biggest boom wrestling ever got was in the 80s in the 90s when that never existed so look that's what brought it there yeah you know? and and here's here's what brought it to where it is today my opinion only obviously mm -hmm. guys that couldn't wrestle that couldn't structure that wow factor needed to do things that were outside of the norm meaning jump off the top of a cage through a table Mm. fall through the cage down to the the mat below mm. um and, and it got to a point where and i always use this cartoon bugs bunny and donald duck when bugs bunny's getting all the cheers and donald duck says how am i going to outdo this guy and what does he do i think he like drinks gasoline and he lights himself up and he explodes or whatever the case may be and as he's floating up over everybody his his, his soul of course yeah. They go, oh, that was great. Listen to the crowd. You know, come do it again. He goes, I can only do it once. And that's that's what makes me think of wrestling today. They're just, they're not relying on their skill and ability to entertain the crowd. And the organization is not helping them along with storylines. Mm. So these guys are jumping over the top rope. How many times can you jump over the top rope? And land on somebody or some bodies. Yeah. How many times you beat someone with a chair, a baseball bat, a sledgehammer? When does it stop? Yeah. 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 Sledgehammer. And yeah. who's buying into the fact that you're actually getting hit with a sledgehammer and then you get up at the end and walk into the locker room? Yeah. Yeah. It's true. Paul, I concur. I actually, I actually warned Rico of the same thing. I've told him, I've warned him yesterday of that tag team he's working with right now, MXM Collection. You know, he was singing their praises, and I told him, I, I don't know. There's something about those guys. They need to learn from him. But that's another story, Paul. He's going to be a All guest. Right. Our, he's going to be a guest on our other show. And as a matter of fact, Paul, you know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking you need to be on that show, too, because it's about time that somebody from your generation told somebody from this generation exactly what for. But I'm just going to leave it. I just, just promised me one thing. Yeah. One thing. Come from Rico. Rico. Yes. Don't ask me to get in the ring with you. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay. Deal. Yeah. It's yeah. only a talk show. Yeah, it's, <laughs> only a, it's only a talk show. It's only a talk show. <laughs> But ladies and gentlemen, I think we've come to the conclusion of this episode. We went on a little bit longer than usual, but it was just a great conversation. And we're going to continue it over. Uh, Paul's going to come over on to Stalin. Uh, Rico, we'd also love to have you as a guest on at some point on Hey Roma, which is totally different. Yes. We launched it yesterday, everybody. Uh, that is non-wrestling. So if you see that in our channel, it's something completely different. We cover a myriad of topics, but we don't touch on pro wrestling. So just so you know. Um, but, uh, gentlemen, thank you both for the time today and thank you audience. Um, ah, yes. I had to put my Sicilian suit on today, drink my, and handle <laughs> the family business. We appreciate your Sicilian suit. Yep. Oh, and by the way, I want this to come from Rico. 
coming, coming from the Godfather over there himself. Right. You got to tell all of our subscribers to hit that subscribe button. The yes. ones that haven't already. Yes. You heard the man. Don't hesitate. Initiate. That's right. Smack that subscribe button That's right, right now. Lay the smack down on it. Gentlemen, stay on the line. But for viewers, we will see you next week. Make you, make sure you subscribe, like, and share. And also, we're on Patreon. So in the month of November, we'll have exclusive episodes on there. So make sure you go over there and subscribe. But until next week, everybody, keep chasing the power of truth. <laughs>